we doing this morning? Good, 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 good. Listen, if you are a first-time guest and you're just tuning in, or the first time you're tuning in online or coming uh, to Pursuit Church, man, I just want to uh, greet you in the only name I believe is worth greeting you in, and that is simply uh, Jesus Christ. And you picked a good Sunday to show up and tune in because we're going to baptize, we're going to dunk some folks. That's good. I love it. Maybe I shouldn't have said dunk. We're going to gently baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're going to have some fun today. I believe, again, God has a word uh, to remind the people. And uh, one thing I know uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt is I would love to stand up here on stage and, and tell each and every one of you that, that things are going to get uh, easier as the time goes on. But there's just something in the inside of me that doesn't quite believe that. And uh, I'm just grateful uh, for what God is doing. And just to give us uh, a simple encouragement and to remind us again of a very powerful biblical truth uh, that I believe every uh, Christian here in America should stand flat footed upon. And if you don't know again who I am, uh, my name is Cliff Moore, the, the current men's pastor. Uh, here at Pursuit Church, and I am so glad uh, to be standing in the house of the Lord uh, this Sunday morning. I struggled, I've been struggling a little while now, especially uh, for these last couple of weeks when I found out that the Lord was going to open the door and give me the opportunity to speak on Sunday morning. And I uh, can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt that my spirit has been for a long time now uh, in the message of the Garden of Gethsemane. And I get in trouble a lot because I know you don't do this, but I do this quite often is when I read God's word, I have a tendency, maybe in a very sinful or unhealthy way uh, to look from a third person's perspective or a third person's uh, point of view. And I start to look at uh, Peter, James and John, even in the garden, and I poke fun of them. And I say, look at these three idiots. How could you fall asleep in the time where Jesus Christ uh, needed you the most? And I just feel like uh, in my heart over these last few weeks that there is a message or two from the garden that God wants uh, to speak to God's people. And as the time uh, grew closer to today, on Sunday, I felt uh, the Spirit of God literally shift the word uh, almost, not to get away from what I believe is a subject that we need to deal with and some things that we need to talk about as a body of Christ. Because part of me uh, really cries out, it really does, not because of people, but crying for people because I understand, again, the hour that we're living in. And it's a struggle on the inside to know that there are men and their husbands, most importantly. And I know this is not a men's a message or a day that we're celebrating men, but men, uh, just to get us to realize and understand the significance that we play, not as only ones that uh, are seed carriers or have the ability to reproduce, but a lot of us are, are like Peter, James, and John in the garden, I believe, in this hour, and that we're, we're asleep when Jesus is really calling on us, when, when Jesus could really use us. We've kind of fallen asleep behind the wheel, and it's not so much that we're going to affect those uh, that, that ourselves it just by ourselves behind the wheel, but the people in our families that will inherently, I believe, uh, be affected as well. And a lot of you, uh, you really don't know my story, but when I was 19 years old, I was actually stationed in Fort Carson, uh, Colorado, and I was downstairs in the barracks and I was playing video games and I heard a couple of my buddies come to me and tell me, I mean, we're going to war. And I heard it and my, it, it caused my ears to stand up and 9-11 had already happened and it was just 2003 and we were, we were been, you know, we've been told and it had been rumored that we were getting amped up, we were getting vehicles, we were getting our weapons, we were going through the gas chamber almost every week, we were doing everything we could in prep, in preparation to go to war. So I went around and I wanted to find out if it was true and come to find out my unit was actually getting stood up to go and fight a battle. 
And as I begin to come back after a 13 month consecutive tour back to America, I, I came off the plane and I battled like a lot of service members with post-traumatic stress syndrome. And I believe Jesus Christ, I know Jesus Christ delivered me through that even when I didn't know him, even when I didn't accept him. And as the Holy Spirit uh, began to just speak to me in a very unique and a very divine way, there was just still a part of me, even at the young uh, tender age of 19 that really couldn't compartmentalize and couldn't really understand the why behind why we were over there doing what we're doing. And here I am today, 39 years of age, and I know I look 19, <laughs> but at 39 years of age right now with a 20 plus year career in the army, I look at my life in the rearview mirror and still there's still just a little piece of me deep inside that still uh, doesn't understand the why behind why we were over there. And I believe that is a lot of us as it pertains to life. We, we're, we're doing everything in our power to, to, to understand the why behind what we do as born again, blood washed, spirit filled believers. And there are many of us that don't know why we come here Sunday morning to hear the worship band worship and not entertain us, but to invoke the presence of God and to hear a man or woman speak on God's pulpit every Sunday. Or trying to get to the why of why we, throughout the, the calendar week, why we are able to, or why we decide to pick certain things and move certain things throughout the week so we can be a part of a Bible study or Bible studies and midweek experience. Or a lot of us struggle with the why of why is it that we continually get out the bed early in the morning and we fight uh, with the alarm clock and we struggle with sleeping. So much of us so many times just want to hit the snooze button. But early in the morning, we continually find ourselves with our nose deep in the word of God. And there's so many of us that are still trying to figure out the why. To why do we continue to go to a secret place and go to a prayer closet and continue to call and speak to a God that we've never laid eyes on? Believing by faith that when we send up prayer and supplication and petitions, that God himself will know and answer every single one of them. Why? And I believe the Holy Spirit right now just wants to give us a gentle reminder of what I believe is the most important thing that any believer, any Christian in America or internationally can ever speak about, and that is simply the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, I don't think there's anything more important biblically in this life than the gospel. And in many American churches, I believe it's the one thing that a lot of American preachers have kind of forgotten about. We can tell you and teach you about everything except for the thing that matters most, and that is Jesus Christ. And what I don't want you to listen to me, what I don't want you to do today is to measure the goodness of God through life and life circumstances. Because what you will do, I'm telling you subconsciously, if you allow life to dictate or determine how good God really is, then when life deals you a blow that you're, that you're not ready, that you're honestly not ready for, when you get a diagnosis and a message and a phone call that you weren't ready to handle, then what you'll begin to do is analytically you will enter into what I believe is a quandary. And what happens is, is subconsciously you will begin to measure God's goodness based on how good life is going. So what happens now is, is God can only be good when life is good. And when life isn't going good, it becomes extremely difficult for us to actually obtain God's goodness. And this is one of the biggest deceptions I believe that the devil, and he's smart, trust me, he's wiser than any man or woman in this building today. And I believe he does a, such a great job in deceiving us and to search after God's goodness through the issues of life and through the circumstances of life. And what I don't want you to do is to begin to look at your life and weigh it more than the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because I'm telling you, if love is anything else outside of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, then there may be a reason why you truly don't understand the goodness of God. And nowhere else but the gospel can give us everything that we need. And I talk to a lot of men and women and there are a lot of brothers and a lot of people who are discouraged that sit in the church every single week. 
And that tells me that you really don't have a, a true understanding of what the gospel is actually all about. And I think America, we've done such a, a, a somewhat of a poor job in really giving the gospel to God's people. And now uh, what I really feel like is the gospel now, especially here in America, it's become this type of uh, beneficiary, survival, take care of me, uh, give me type of message. And now a lot of us, we're not even willing to even pursue Christ and the works of Jesus Christ unless we know there's something in it for us. And unfortunately, I believe that is the attitude for a lot of us. And the best way to pinpoint that and identify that is through simple relationships. And that's why I believe statistically a lot of marriages, even in the church and outside the church, struggle the way that they do. Because what happens in the beginning of this relationship is you've got little Johnny that stands on one side and you've got little Janie that stands on the other. And little Johnny says, man, I, I'm in love with Janie and Janie's really in love with Johnny and they want to get married. And oftentimes what they do is they come together, they say I do, they do the honeymoon thing, if they can afford it, right? And if they can't, they celebrate, they enjoy one another, and then here comes Monday morning back to work. And now both Johnny and Janie have both said I do to one another. And the first 18 months to two years of this marriage is a struggle. And why is it such a struggle between Johnny and Janie? Well, Johnny, the husband, all he does is take from Janie. He takes from her mentally. He takes from her physically. He takes from her psychologically and financially. And then little Janie stands on the opposite side of little Johnny wanting to do the same thing. Take, take, take. And now you've got two individuals who said I do, who are supposedly committed to one another, that love each other supposedly unconditionally. And now in year two and a half, three, they don't even want to be joined together in marriage anymore. Why? Because they spent the front half of the marriage taking from one another instead of giving of themselves. And the marriage doesn't survive because I've, you've given me, Janie says, Johnny's given me what I wanted on the front end. Johnny's like, yeah, I got what I wanted too. And a lot of it I got before we even said I do. So there's no reason to pursue you anymore. There's no reason to come after you. And I'm here to warn you, church, listen to me. Jesus Christ did not pay the radical price that he paid on a hill in Golgotha between two thieves just to give us stuff. But that the gospel message has been set up and designed to transform you and I. And we need transformation. And it's this thing now where we come to church and we want to be entertained. We want the right type of song, the right type of note, the right type of message. Give me, give me, give me, give me. We almost have a taker spirit. We're not willing to give the kingdom of God anything uh, of ourselves, but we're willing to take. And so many of us take and we've been takers. And there's that thing inside of us, I believe, even in birth, that we want it just to take and turn it all on us. All the attention goes on us. And I'll tell you, when you talk about the gospel message and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and the message that Paul would paint here in the scriptures, what you find oftentimes is what the gospel message does is it takes the message, really, and it turns the, the, the light on, on everybody else but us. And that's a hard thing for a lot of us because there's a glory hound, I believe, that lives inside every, every man and woman in the room today. That wants to take the credit for everything that we do. Wants to pat on the back. Wants to be entertained. Wants to be told what we want to hear versus what we need to hear. But the gospel message. Oh, I love it. So let's see what the Bible says. Because many, many people have their own opinion. What they believe that the gospel is. And I ask a lot of people just in passing. Not the, not the kind of stump the chump type deal, but just to ask people in general conversation what the gospel is, and very few people can actually identify biblically what the word of God actually says the gospel is. Most people say good news, and that's right to the, to the point of it, the word gospel being translated from its original language into English. But what does the actual Bible say that the gospel really is? I'm glad you asked. First Corinthians. And it should be on the screen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 
And this is the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Corinth. Listen to what this says, the risen Christ and face reality. Listen to this. Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you, making a declaration, I declare to you the gospel which I preached. And I want to hang out there just for a few seconds because every time I look at that, when Paul makes an emphasis on the gospel that he's preaching, to me, it leads me to believe that there's probably some other gospels that are floating around in Corinth. And I'll tell you today, there's a lot of tricky, deceitful, cunning, undermining type of messages that are floating around in American Christianity. In fact, if you're not careful, you'll be deceived. And I don't care how holy you are, how righteous you believe that you are, or how long or how close you walk with the Lord. There's some very deceitful messages that appear to actually be the gospel, but when you actually get close enough to them, what you realize when you measure them up against the word of God that they're not even the gospel. That many of them, if this table was the gospel, would actually walk just as close, just about as close as it could get to calling itself the gospel while at the same time simultaneously never being the gospel. And we need to be careful because there's a lot of stuff out there And it's appealing, it's sensual in nature. Again, it's very attractive. And a lot of it is is even demonic in its origin. But I want you to hear what Paul says. He says, I'm making a declaration to you, the gospel which I preached, which also you received and in which you stand. The gospel is the thing that should cause us in these final hours to stand even when it becomes difficult to stand. And I know this is a new idea for the American church because honestly, if you ask just my opinion, and this isn't Bible, this is just my opinion, so you can take it with a grain of salt, but I don't believe statistically or historically that the American church as a whole has ever suffered real persecution. I don't. And a a young little man down in South Carolina running in and shooting up people during Bible study, to me is not persecution. To me, that's, that's a man that's being led demonically by the supernatural force of darkness. Nobody in here had a gun in their mouth this morning before they came in the church. We're not underground in a basement secretly proclaiming Jesus Christ and being really, really quiet. Not yet anyway. None of us are not going to have yet in America. Nobody's going to go home today, hopefully, and have armed sentries at your door waiting to get your personal identification and most importantly, trying to ascertain whether you are a spirit-filled, born-again believer yet. Other countries are, are gearing up and actually doing this, but not here in America. And it amazes me how comfortable we, we've gotten as an American church. Comfortable. Come to church late, do what we want, read the Bible when we want, pray when we want, pray when we feel like it. I only want to really pull on God when we need something. Don't come to him because we love him. We don't give him adoration because of the act, the radical act that took place on Calvary's cross. Ah, that's just doing too much. Cliff, you're over the top. And people have told me that. You're just doing too much. You're too loud. It doesn't take all of that. And I'm a firm believer that it not only takes that, it takes that and then some. Because if you truly know what I've been saved from, what I've been delivered from, what God has truly brought me from, and the goodness of Jesus Christ wrapped in the sin of the crucifixion, you would be just as loud and obnoxious about the name of Jesus as I am. The gospel means something. And we got to stop pursuing Jesus just like when we need something. How would you feel as a parent if the only time your children wanted to reach out to you is when they needed something? How would you feel? Not to tell you that they love you, not to spend time with you, not to hold you 
and put their arms around you and say thank you for all that you've done for me. And I believe we become lazy and complacent, even blinded to the reality of the goodness of Jesus Christ and measured against the crucifixion. And now we're, again, life is starting to actually speak louder than truth. And I can tell you from personal experience that when you use life as an instrument to speak louder than God's word, that there's no freedom there, there's no power there, and there's no authority there. We've got to be careful. The time is winding down. I know you think you got all day, but you don't. Time's running out. And there's a gospel that we're supposed to be standing on. There are people right now whose souls are literally in the balance. People's eternities are at stake. And here we are just... <laughs> Like it's cool. Like it's, it's okay. Calm down, Cliff. The Bible says that this is what makes me stand. This is the reason why I do what I do. I understand Proverbs 11 and 30 when it says that the fruit of the righteous is the tree of life and to them that win souls are wise. What other, what other wise, more wise thing could I be put on earth to do but to be in a position to win souls back to the kingdom of heaven? What else is worth more? What else is more important? What else is more important than celebrating salvation? What's more important than talking the deep things of God? What's more important than watching people go public with their faith through baptism? What's more important than the gospel? But we've got it confused. And the band can come on out. We're missing it. But the Bible that I read, Brother Sam, and the God that I serve says the gospel is the thing that's going to make me stand. There's going to come an hour, and I'm telling you, God has showed me through a dream, and maybe it'll come out one day. But there's going to be an hour where Americans are really going to have to stand almost like it's going to become a season where God is going to begin to call our bluffs. And the pastors that, that, that come up here every Sunday morning in America that say that they love Jesus and say that they'll do anything and they'll die for the name of Jesus. See, that doesn't mean a lot right now because we're not having to suffer real persecution. But the Holy Spirit has let me know that America, watch my words, mark my words. You can write this day down. You can put it in your book, put it in your notes on your iPhone. You can put it in your notion, your things three. You can do all of that. The day is coming. And as the Holy Spirit is trying to just nudge us gently, he's such a gentleman. He's not boisterous. He's not really trying to knock us out the way, but he's gently trying to get the attention of the American church. I'm telling you, this is the thing that we stand upon. Paul says in verse 2, by which also you are saved. The gospel is the only thing that will save this country and save your soul. It has the power to save. Stop putting your hope in flesh. We need God's spirit above anyone and anything else. The Bible even says in Acts chapter 4 verse 12 that the name of Jesus is the only authoritative name under heaven by which men must be saved. No other God, Buddha can't save you. Allah, Harry Potter, whoever else you're serving. Some of us very sinfully, and we won't be honest, but I know what part of the country I'm living in. I've been all over the world. And some of us have put our faith in the White House more than we put in Jesus Christ. I want you to listen to me. You're going to have to stand flat-footed on the word of God. And the gospel is the only thing that is going to save your soul. So we can continue to play, play games like it's a game. And I'm, I'm here to tell you it's not. 
But the Bible says through Paul's writings that it saves. And he says, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, which I preach to you, he says, unless you believed in vain. See, Paul wasn't playing with the gospel because he remembers his life prior to the gospel. And I think some of us have been walking with the Lord for so long, we very rarely reflect our lives prior to the gospel. And one of the things that keeps me humbly on my knees and humbly on my face is that the Holy Spirit never lets me forget what my life was and what my life could have been prior to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why I'm loud like I'm loud. And I'm crazy. And I don't care what you think about me. And there was a time where I was convinced that I needed people's approval. That I needed people to like me and I wanted to be, I wanted, I wanted to be accepted. And the closer that Jesus Christ allows me to come into his presence, I understand that this is a lonely walk. That in fact, there ain't going to be many, the Bible says, the way that leads to eternal life is narrow and very few will even find it. That it's a tight rope that leads to heaven. That it means I may have to say no to some people. I may have to say no to some lifestyle, some ye or yes to some lifestyle changes. I may have to put some stuff down that my flesh doesn't want to put down. I may have to say yes even if it's not popular. I may have to do some things that, 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 that just <laughs> I just normally wouldn't do, but the Spirit of God is just wanting me to do. It may cause me to take a different path and to go into hiding like Elijah. But I'm willing to do that because the love of God isn't measured upon what goes in, on in Cliff's life, but it's measured upon the perfect crucifixion of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as easy it would be for me to turn back to the love of the world like the Apostle Demas in the word of Timothy, I could do that. Nothing stops me from doing that. But to know where the Lord has saved me from, I can't go back. I'd be foolish to turn back and go the other way. I'd be insane to go back. And Paul says in verse 3, For I deliver to you the first of all that which I received, that Christ died. That Christ died. That Christ died. And if Christ died, I'm, I'm here to tell you, the Bible already lets us know, we've got to willing to die to ourselves. As much as some of you live by the mantra of doing you, doing you is what's going to send a lot of the people in the church in America straight to hell for eternity because you want to do you. And one of the greatest warnings the Bible ever warns about is the state of reprobate. Which means for those who are turned over to a way of reprobate, Jesus is literally going to allow some of us to be turned over to ourselves, our own sensuality, our own pleasure, our own way of thinking, doing life, obtaining treasures. And I'm telling you, the further you go and the deeper you go, you become more and more separated from the Lord and Savior who is Jesus Christ. He died. Which means there's probably something that ought to die in me. And a lot of you have felt like there's a ceiling above you that you can't break through. There's a wall in front of you. And you went, you went through that season where you would just, it seemed like you and God were just as close as two peas in a pod. And now you can't figure out what's going on. And I found oftentimes when I searched the scriptures, and I humble myself before the mighty presence of God that there's something inside of me that he wants to kill. And as gracious and as humble as he is, he doesn't poke fun of me. He doesn't condemn me. He doesn't, he doesn't necessarily put me on blast for everybody to know about it. But when I search him out through my heart in a secret place, he, let, he, let, he says, son, I, I, I want to carry you further. I want to take you to the higher and I want to take you to the deeper. But there's just something that you will not let the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit kill inside of you. And the moment you give that thing to me and kill it and die like I had to die for all of humanity, we can pick up and get up and we can continue to march along the journey. 
And Paul says here, after I received that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day. Not one amen. Well, amen to myself. He rose again. And Jesus Christ didn't pay that type of price just to give us stuff and to give us blessings. But it was to put his image back inside of us. It was to put his life back inside of us. It was to remind us of who we were created to be from the original time that we were created. And even after all the things in the earth got skewed through the seed of Adam, God still had a ram in the bush. And his name was Jesus. So he introduces a man who knew no sin, who was slain before the foundations of the world. He lives a life free of sin with no guile in his mouth. He's made fun of, he's poked, his hair's pulled, He's made fun of crowns of thorns on his head. He's beat. He's betrayed even by the, by the one that he loves. People give up on him. Disciples turn their back. And then on the crucifixion, you think they'd at least give the son of the living God a piece of his own property on the hill in Golgotha, but they stuck him between two thieves. And as the Bible says, according to St. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 50, as, the, as God yielded up the spirit or gave up the ghost, that it caused a frantic and a, and a panic in the city. And when they ran back to the tomb, they were expecting to see a body. <laughs> I'm trying to contain myself. And I can't imagine what the centurion, what the guards at the tomb thought when the body was gone. But little did they know the man that they killed was the son of the living God. That all the people that thought it was a joke and thought it wasn't real started to believe again. And I believe Jesus' death led more people to salvation than even his life. And now in the temple, the veil has been torn, which symbolizes us having access to the Father only through the Son. And if we could just believe and stand on the gospel, how much damage could we do to Satan's kingdom and how far could we advance God's? So I don't know what your measuring stick is for love, but please don't let it be your life. Because most of you have experienced more death, sickness, and all sorts of stuff just these last year, these last two years, than you've experienced in a lifetime. But it doesn't change the goodness of God. Even if God doesn't decide to bless you with another thing, his name is still worthy to be praised. So I hope the nudge from the Holy Spirit, you just say yes. The Bible says in 1 Samuel that obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is greater than the offering of the fat of rams. There's power there. And there's freedom right there. Go ahead and stand to your feet. And as we get to celebrate publicly of those lives that have been changed from the inside out, we couldn't do this if there was no this, the gospel opened up the opportunity for us to celebrate that. And I feel the presence of God so strong. 
And what I believe God wants to do right now in these next 60 seconds is just open up the door for the opportunity to know him as Lord and Savior. So what I want you to do now, except if you're on a camera or security, if you are not on a camera and if you are not security, I want your head bowed and your eye closed, both of them. Every head bow and every eye closed. If you felt the presence of the living God speak to you today, that wasn't a man, that was Jesus Christ. And I don't want to leave this stage and abandon this opportunity to open up the invitation for somebody to be saved. Nobody's looking at you right now. Stop worrying about what your friend's going to think. Nobody cares about that guy or that gal standing behind you or standing next to you. If you do not know Jesus Christ as the Savior and the ultimate Lord of glory of your life, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want you to just lift your hand. Lift your hand. It's okay. God sees you. God sees you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God sees you. God sees you. God sees you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You can put them down. I'm going to pray. And we're going to celebrate God through baptism. <laughs>